In this video, we're going to look at the graphical method to analyze two-dimensional conduction heat transfer problems. First, I'll derive the method, and then I'll provide an example of using it. Let's consider this 2D conduction problem, where we have a rectangular part of piece of material, where part of this is exposed to a temperature, a high temperature of 50 degrees centigrade, the entire bottom is exposed to a temperature of 25 degrees centigrade, and the remaining boundaries are all insulated. I've solved this using my Python program, and I can see that on the north and south boundary, I have 24,316.37 watts in the negative direction coming in the north boundary, because it's negative, and it's perfectly balanced by that same heat rate going out the entire south boundary. So I know what the heat transfer is, but what if I wanted to derive this by simply drawing a picture and exploiting my knowledge of the physics of conduction heat transfer? We can calculate from this solution the heat flux vectors. So I've plotted here in black temperature contour lines. So heat transfer is always perpendicular to the contour lines. And in calculating the heat flux vector, we get a graphical visualization that yes, all of these heat flux vectors are everywhere perpendicular to these contour lines. The heat is coming in here, and it's spreading out to fill this bottom area. You can see it here, perpendicular to all these contour lines. And we can use this knowledge in order to calculate what the heat transfer rate is if we didn't know what it was, if we wanted to estimate it. And so if we define a line that is everywhere parallel to these heat flux vectors, that line will be an adiabat. That is, that'll be a line through which there is no heat transfer, because by definition it's parallel to all the heat flux vectors. And that means if we can draw those lines, those adiabats, as I've done here, see several adiabats here. These are everywhere perpendicular to the temperature contour or parallel to the heat flux vector. There is no heat transfer through these lines. Likewise, an insulated boundary is by definition an adiabat, which means the temperature contour is much all, must always be perpendicular to insulated boundaries or all of these adiabats. It also means that any little bit of heat transfer that comes in through this surface here is going to pass all the way through and out here because it can't go through the adiabat. And so once I've tr drawn these number of lines, I can count the number of spaces there is uh, for little bits of heat transfer, to little bits of thermal energy to pass through. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I'm going to call that M. What I've found is that there are M, M spaces between the adiabats that I've chosen to draw, and in this case, M is equal to 9. Now, I can also count the spaces between the contour lines. Now these are evenly spaced contour lines and these are evenly spaced adiabats. These contour lines have the same delta t between each and every line, so they're equally spaced in temperature, while the adiabats are equally spaced over the area where we have heat transfer coming into our system. If I count the spaces between the temperature contour lines, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I see that I have 9 spaces, so n is 9 for what's being developed here. m equals 9, n equals 9. Now, if we look at an individual volume that's formed by these lines, looking at this little region here, I'm just going to call that J, and I'm going to ask the question about what is the temperature change between the high temperature and the low temperature over that one little uh, space, and I'm going to call that J. I'll call it delta Tj, even though I know it's, it's from the high temperature to the low temperature. Well, my total temperature difference between T1 at 50, or this line here, and T2 at 25, is equal to the number of spaces I have between there times that change for any one space, so the delta Tj here. And that means that I can define that delta Tj over this one little region to be T1 minus T2 over n, because each of these spaces has an equal change in temperature. Now I can apply Fourier's law, where I've known the direction, I know the heat transfer is going from high temperature to low temperature, and I've defined delta Tj that way, so I don't have the negative sign. But the heat energy that's going through this heat lane here between these two adiabats is going to be given by the conductivity times the area, which is delta x, the width of this, times, I've assumed it's a dimension of 1 into the screen, times the temperature difference over this volume, divided by the physical distance between these two to approximate that temperature gradient in Fourier's law. Well, I can substitute my definition of Tij in here, and so I get k delta x over delta y times t1 minus t2 over n. So now I have the conductivity that I know, the n for the number of lanes that I counted, and I have t1 and t2 that I know. 
And I have this ratio delta x over delta y that came from the area for the heat transfer and the delta y in the gradient. Now if I want to know the total heat transfer rate coming out this surface, or going in this surface, it's simply the summation of all of these individual lanes. And because we've drawn them to be equally spaced where the heat energy is coming in, that sum of all of those, all the QIs are the same, and that sum is simply the number of lanes times that individual QI for which we just came up with an expression. So if I put that together, my total heat transfer rate is equal to the conductivity times this delta X over delta Y times M over N times my known temperature difference. And that means that I know everything in this expression except delta X and delta Y. Well, if I draw my drawing such that delta X is equal to delta Y, that is that all of these intersections make something that is very close to a square, then delta X will be equal to delta Y, it will cancel out from my expression, and I'll get an expression here that Q is approximately equal to this, where now I know everything in this expression, provided I have an adequate drawing. So in this, for this drawing, if I predict that, my conductivity used in calculating this was 400 watts per meter Kelvin, I have an M of 9 heat lanes and an N of 9 spaces between my temperature contours, and my temperature difference is 25. So that would mean that I would have 10,000 watts going through here. As we saw from the calculation, we actually have 24,316 watts going through there. Now, I can clearly see that these are not squares, which means that I have too many temperature contours relative to the number of heat lanes that I have here. So let's draw it again with less heat lanes to try and make this square. Now I've reduced n to 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and if I repeat my calculation, it's gone up substantially to 18,000, which is again, which is much closer to the 24,300. But I can still see that these volumes are still visibly rectangular. So let's try less spaces between the temperature contours. So now I've reduced my n to 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 or almost 4. Um, and if I repeat that calculation with the 4, now I see I'm up to 22,500 watts, which is getting very close to this actual prediction from the computer code. So what's the process for doing this? We draw equally spaced adiabats over the region where we know that we have heat energy coming into our problem. We then draw temperature contours everywhere perpendicular to those adiabats, everywhere perpendicular, and that includes an insulated boundary which is an adiabat, insulated boundary here, always perpendicular, insulated boundary here, always perpendicular. And when we draw it, we want to ensure that we're making each of these, each of these regions that are formed to be as square as possible. And if we do that, if they're as square as possible, then we have an expression to calculate uh, the heat rate through there. This is an actually a very useful method because it forces us to think about the physics of what's going on. It forces us to realize that there's no heat transfer through an adiabat. It forces us to realize that temperature contours are always perpendicular to adiabats, and that includes our insulated boundaries. And so we have to think about the physics of what's going on in order to do this. And if we compare this to the, for the expression for a shape factor, the heat rate was equal to the shape factor times the temperature difference, so the shape factor that we would get from using this method is that it's m over n will give us our shape factor. So let's apply this to an example. You may have seen this example before. We have a hot uh, cylinder embedded in a rectangle, in this case it's a square, uh, and we want to calculate the, the heat transfer from the, from the hot surface embedded to the boundaries of this which are all at T2. So let me blow that up. Here's my example here. Now the first thing I'm going to do to try and analyze this problem using the graphical method is to look for any axis of symmetry, because if it's an axis of symmetry, it's by definition an adiabat. And that means that I have eight equal regions that are going to have exactly the same solution. So I don't need to analyze the whole thing. I can instead look at one piece of these eight pieces, which will all have the identical heat transfer through them. And at the end, we'll simply multiply the answer we get for this one piece times 8 to get the total for the entire geometry. Okay, so the first step is to draw equally spaced adiabats. That's not so hard in this geometry. If I distribute lines equally across here and equally across here, then those must be my equally spaced adiabats. And so the way I've chosen to draw these here, 1, 2, 3, 4, is my m value for the number of heat lanes spaces between my adiabats. Next, 
I need to draw temperature contours everywhere perpendicular to the adiabats, and I need to make each volume that's produced to be as square as possible to satisfy the assumption we made in deriving our equation. So if I do that, I want to draw these everywhere perpendicular, and I think this is a reasonable drawing. These are all relatively close to square, or as close to square as I can make them drawing. And so, in this case, to make them square, it looks like n is approximately equal to 6. Great, so let's calculate our shape factor. It's that m over n, n, m over capital N, and of course we have n sections, so we have to multiply by n in order to get the total for the whole geometry. So if I do that, m is 4, n is 6, and there's 8 sections. That gives me a shape factor of 5.33. Now this is a geometry that I can look up. I can go to a textbook or the literature and I can find the geometry for this. And the shape factor that's given in the literature for this is 2 pi l over the logarithm of 1.08 times the width, this is the width here, over the diameter. For this geometry that I've drawn here, the width is three times the diameter. And so this, this ratio is three. And of course, we use an L of one in the derivation. L is the distance into the screen. And so I'll put an L of one in there and a W of D over, w over D of three. So if I evaluate that, I get 5.34. This means that just by drawing this picture and thinking about the physics of the heat transfer, I could have gotten a very, very good answer for this without having to go to the textbook. If you happen to be stranded on a beach and you have nothing but a stick and you really need to know the shape factor for a circle inside a rectangle, you can calculate it this way and have reasonable confidence that you'll have a pretty good answer.